you talking about getting older. Uh, at the funeral, I called Carolyn Monday, Carolyn Proctor. Did y'all pick up on that? <laughs> I went and apologized to the family. I told them I've, I've lost two Carolyns here in a couple of months, and it's, it's hard to get them off. I was thinking about Rodney and Carolyn today. Boy, I miss them. Uh, all of my saved life, just about Rodney and Carolyn Proctor have uh, been there. And uh, well, I'll tell you what, I've, I hated, hated to bury them. I'm glad they went together, though. You know, I, I thank God for that. Uh, but anyway, all right. Psalm chapter number six. Let me get this turned on, get a little bit more volume up. And I'm glad we've got this up working good. We had actually a two-fold problem. That connection right down here beside of that plug-in, when you move it, uh, you'd have a picture and not have a picture. So I went down, wiggled all of them. I retaped that and put a new one in there. We've got that new computer in there. And that is state-of-the-art. That was the fastest running computer that they had uh, at Best Buy. So cost a little over $800. I thought it'd be more than that. Uh, but that all last us a long time. It has 3.0 USBs in it instead of 2.0. Uh, I don't know if any of you noticed here lately, most people don't watch it because you're here in the service. But you know, I go, you know, you get that slow motion thing going on. Uh, so Lord willing, it ought to take care of us for a time to come. Psalm chapter 6. Now as we go through the Psalms, I'm going to give... Uh, Biblical interpretation, I believe you always need to do that. Give a biblical interpretation and then make a practical application to the people. And we're going to try to do that. When you get to Psalms, I don't know all the history around it, uh, but it begins with this, to the chief musician on Nagineth and Shemineth. You say, what are these things? They're instruments. Did you know that David made most of the musical instruments that they used? He made those. But he said a psalm of David. I want to deal with this psalm of David tonight. I know it was authored or uh, supposedly by King David. I don't know the historical background. Sometimes we know he's hiding in a cave or he's doing this or he's doing that. No idea with this. But I found this, uh, this a very interesting psalm. I want to read the whole psalm, and then we're going to look at it. But he said, O Lord, rebuke me not. Now, what I want to deal with tonight, evidently the, the context of this psalm is when David was uh, being rebuked by the Lord. He was actually on the chastening hand of the Lord. Uh, only two times in the Bible do I find where he was really a bad boy, all right? One with Bathsheba, the other was when he numbered the people and God chastened uh, not him, but chasing the nation of Israel. So I'm going to say it's, this has nothing to do with any of these. But you need to understand that these were people just like we are. They had their faults. David was a, a, a man of war. Let me tell you, that's, you know, we don't know a whole lot about war. We know uh, some about it. This man lived in war. He killed his ten thousands. I'm, I'm telling you, he, he, he was not always a choir boy in every instance. I wouldn't believe. So I figure some, some time or the other, he got out of sorts with the Lord, and that's the background that we find. He said, "Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak." O oh Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed. But Thou, O oh Lord, how long? Return, O oh Lord, deliver my soul. O oh, save me for Thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of Thee. In the grave who shall give Thee thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. Now, he's getting his answer here in the last. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly." So in the first couple of three verses in here, uh, we find David's uh, 
plea to the Lord in here. And I thank God for this. As we get into the chastening, I'm not going to deal with it long tonight, because, but all of us are going to suffer chastening at some time or the other. This is a man after God's own heart. This was not just somebody that didn't love the Lord. This was a man that loved God with all of his heart and his soul and mind, his body. But we find that there were times when God had to chasten him. Even the best of our children, there are times when they need to be chastened. The Bible said, you spare the rod, you what? Spoil the child. The Bible said, if you spare the rod, you actually hate the child. Why? If you don't discipline your children right, if you let them run wild or do whatever they want, you are actually training them at an early age to be disobedient to authority when they get over. That's why you've got to get them. I, I personally believe if you get a hold of them when they're young, then you have to chasten them a whole lot less when they get older. They become more obedient to you and, and in, a, in a right manner, not just out of fear, but out of love and respect. But as I looked at this, David pleads for the mercy of God instead of the judgment of God in his anger. This psalm tells me that he's been in this for a while, but look what he said, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot disple displeasure. What he was doing with God, he was pleading with God to be gentle with him. You know, when I pray for our family, I, I want them to be saved. And I always tell God, you do what you have to to get their attention. That's a hard prayer to pray. You, you, don't, you don't want hardship on children, but at the same time, you don't want them to die without Christ either. So you've got to, to but I always ask God to temper his justice with his mercy. Look at verse number two. That he said, have mercy upon me, O Lord. So he's come to a place in that chastisement to where he's seeking the mercy of God, but he's also pleading the love of God, the compassion of God in his life. I've often said this, and, and I, I'll say it again tonight, God's been a whole lot better to me than I've been to him. God's been a lot better to me than I've been to him. I'm not talking about before I got saved, folks. I'm talking about after I got saved. I've not been a perfect man. There have been times when God had to deal with me about some things, but I remember one time old Rodney Proctor was preaching. He had come in off the mission field, and I was sitting back there leaning forward the way I do, getting ready to get into the message. God had been dealing with me for a little while about something. He'd been dealing with me in that area. So I had opened my book, and as soon as I saw his text, I, I told the Lord, this is for me. And before he ever began to preach, I bowed my head and I told God, I am so sorry, Lord, we're going to get this problem fixed from this time right on. Hey, I, I thank God that God loved me enough that he laid on Rodney Proctor's heart. You know, sometimes I preach, people say, you know, I look around, but I really don't see anybody. Now, I'm funny about that. They say, well, did you hear this? Did you see this? Did you... I don't see people get up and leaving. I don't, I don't hear babies cry per se. I, I just, you know, I don't, I just get kind of fixed in. So if I'm looking at you, you need to understand I'm not looking at you. But I've learned not to stare at one person. You know, I, I don't want to stare straight down the aisle and preach down the aisle. So I just move my head around. I look at people without seeing people. But God, God sees us where we are, and God's good to us, and God deals with us, and sometime God will tailor make a message for you about something that the pastor knows nothing about. So don't ever take the preaching in a personal way unless God the Holy Spirit makes it personal to you. Now, if He makes it personal to you, He in His loving kindness is correcting you one, he'll do it with a still, small voice. And two, he'll do it with the Word of God. Then he'll do it with some other means, but they become progressive in nature. But we find him at a point in his life and he said, Lord, I'm seeking your mercy now. So now he's ready to get ready. But at the same time, I want to look at his predicament in verses three down, or 2 down through 5. He's been there a long time. He said, Lord, I'm weak. Why, why would a man of God like him be weak? It's because that he had been wrestling with something over a long period of time. Now, I'm not talking about if 
so much physical weakness. I think he was a, a man's man. A lot of time we think of him as a little boy with his little harp sitting on the hill. You know, let me tell you something. When he tried on Saul's armor, Saul was head and shoulders above every man in Israel. That tells me he's probably over seven feet tall. And when David tried on his armor and put it off, he didn't put it off. He didn't say, man, this thing's swallowing me. He said, I've not yet proved it. He could have worn it. He's the man that took Goliath's sword. Can you imagine the size of the sword that belonged to a man nine and a half feet tall? Can you imagine what? Hey, I, I'm, I'm sure he didn't have a little toothpick uh, that he carried in his hand. He had a sword like nobody else's, and David said there's none like it. And from that day forward, he carried that sword. He was a man. But I want you to notice he had been here a while. He said, Lord, he said, I'm weak. Oh, Lord, heal me for my bones are vexed. He was now beginning to even feel this thing physically in his life. You know, if you, when you get down psychologically, if you're not careful, it will carry over into your physical. Uh, hey, your, your mind has a lot to do with physiology. It's got a lot to do with that. I remember one time years ago, I was reading in Ripley's Believe It or Not, and most of it I chose not to believe. I don't know what's... But they talked about a woman that had a dream when she was a young girl. I'm talking about a young teenage girl that on a certain day and a certain hour, years and years in the future, she dreamed that she would die, and that lingered with her all her life. She lived in fear of that. But that book said that when that day and hour came, she died. That was just simply the power of mind over matter. If I told you I was going to hold a red hot poker to you and blindfolded you and you thought it was, I could put a, 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 an eraser on a pencil against your skin and you would burn in your skin. I want you to notice where he was. He said, my bones are vexed. He said, my soul is sore vexed, but thou, Lord, how, how long? Lord, how long are you going to suffer with me in this condition? His soul, his, the very being that he was, he was in trouble. Notice what he said in verse 4. Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. Now he's not talking about a spiritual salvation. I don't know when David became a child of God by faith. The, the, you know, the Bible doesn't give anything. All we know was he was a man that believed the Lord. And he took the Lord at, at, at his word. I don't know when he was saved. He's talking about a physical deliverance. He said, I want you to save me by the mercy's sake. Verse number five, he, he put this out. He said, for in death there's no remembrance of thee in the grave. Who shall give thee thanks? Now what he's talking about is this, not that he's going to be in the grave, but once you bury somebody, their service for the Lord in this life is over with. I thought about that this morning. I was reading this morning and I, I thought about Miss Carolyn. You know, Miss Carolyn can no longer witness for the Lord. She can no longer praise the Lord among the people. She's no longer able to do that here. Listen, if you're going to, if you're going to do something for God, you've got to do it on this side of the grave. You can't do it on the other side of the grave. It's, it's just, but he pleaded with that. But he talked about his night in verse number six. He said, I'm weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Sleepless nights of weeping, but not getting that thing right. You know, a lot of times when we continue to weep like that, it's, we're not getting it right. I mean, our heart's broken, but for some reason we're not yet ready to turn the way we need to turn to God. And the weeping goes on. I believe when somebody gets right with God, I think that the peace of God that passeth all understanding, you know, a, a clear conscience makes for a soft pillow. So we find a man who was weeping all night. He wept so much that his couch was wet with his tears. So we find the predicament that he was in. But then we found also that his possible condition in here. He said in the grave, listen, he could have died. He could have died. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, we use this a lot when we take the Lord's table. 
said, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly, uh, sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we're judged, we're chastened to the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. He knew there was a possibility of God taking him home. Uh, through the years, I, and I never know anything for sure, but there have been a couple of instances where I thought that God just took somebody home. They just absolutely refused to do right. I did, visited one man several times, and, and he was just where he was, and he was not going to budge. I remember on a Tuesday morning, I think it's a Thursday morning, I was here at the church, and the telephone rang, and it, he, it was his wife. And she said, my husband's dead. And I thought he was just sleeping. I said, well, he's probably not dead. Just need what she said, he's dead. She said, can you come over? Went over there, and the Lord had taken him home. I'll never forget, one of his children came by. I was over there uh, right after his death, and they, of course, called the kids. He had been witnessing to one of his children, and his children came in as I was finally leaving his house. And he looked at me, and he said, preacher, did you get dad straight? Never forget that. I thought, boy, what damage can be done. But we find his physical condition or the possibility of it. Then in verse number 6, that penance, that loss of sleep. Verse 7 and 8, we find his price. He said in verse number 7, Mine eyes consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. So we find here that David had a price that he was going to have to pay. His enemies surrounded him. And then we find his peace in verses 8 through 10. That verse 9, the Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Now, we find where he was. I have no idea what he did or why he did or why he waited so long. But he did. I'm talking about a man after God's own heart. Sometimes the Bible will open up their hearts. I use often Romans chapter 7 where we see into the heart of the Apostle Paul uh, where he talked about the sin that he fought with, he, he battled with within his heart. I have no idea what his problems were, but I do know this. People have problems in their life. Pastors have, pastors have to watch their spiritual life. They've got to watch how they behave. They've got to watch where they go. They've got to keep an eye on this flesh. You know, a lot of pastors don't. They think they can handle things. And the next thing you know, they get caught up in something. And then eventually they get caught. And then when they do, and it's uncovered. And I, I believe with all my heart that when a man stands in this pulpit, he must have the aspect of blamelessness. He must be blameless in some areas. It doesn't mean sinless. But that means blameless. I think when a pastor, there's certain things he can do with it will disqualify him in some certain areas. But we find the chastening of the Lord. Now, I want to look at that just for a minute. You find over in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. Just turn there a minute. We're going to turn a couple of times. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. You get to, I've got things all through my Bible here where I had places marked for the services this afternoon. First Thessalonians chapter number five. Ah, there it is. Amen. We're, we're, we're familiar with these verses, but I want to notice verse number 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, this is in a listing of things. This starts in verse 16. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit. Despise not prophesying. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain all appearance of evil and. 
So we find the possibility tonight of you and I getting out of the will of God. I don't think every time we start down that road that we start down that road with the intent of ending up where we're going. Satan has a way of blinding our eyes to the end of the path that we begin to walk at times. That's why I think it's important tonight that our people stay in the Word of God. I want you to stay in the Bible. I want you to have some devotional time. I want you to do some reading. I want you to stay in. When I'm preaching the Word of God, hey, I don't want you going to sleep. <laughs> I don't want you falling over and hitting your head on the pew. I want you to listen up. Why? The Word of God is what helps us. I need that. When we were reading again today, I saw something I want to preach on one time. We were reading this morning here in the service. Boy, just jumped off of the page at me as we read it. And I thought, man, I've got to put a mark by that. I'm going to have to preach that sometime. But what happens is sometime we start slipping away from the Word of God. If you start stopping your prayer of time, if you start stopping your Bible reading, if you quit doing these things, I don't care how good you are, how moral you are, you begin on a path that's going to end up somewhere to where you don't want it. So what happens is, as God's children, we've got to learn to cut these things off, dip them in the bud. Soon as you start something, hey, and, and by the way, you know right from wrong just like I do. I hate it when somebody tells me, preacher, you're wrong, and I know I'm wrong. <laughs> hey, I already know it. Hey, man, I, I hate it. I told you so. Boy, I hate it when somebody uses that phraseology. I told you so. Listen, I don't want to hear that. I know I messed up. I know that I'm wrong. So when we start down that path, immediately we need to start corrective measures at that point in time. That's why he said abstain, didn't say abstain from evil, but he talked about abstaining from all appearance. That means that somewhere down the road, what you're doing could turn wrong down the road someplace. Now, where do you cut it off? You cut it off before you get down the road. The farther you get down the road, sometimes the harder the corrective uh, part of it gets. And we'll deal with that in just a few moments. So I'm talking about something evidently David didn't do. Over in 1 John 1, 9, we know this, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, again, that word confession means that we have to come to a point somewhere to where we agree with God about what we're doing. You want to know if something's wrong? You know how to find out if it's wrong? Ask God. Just ask God. Is it what I'm doing right or is it what I'm doing wrong? God, listen, God will answer you real quick in those areas. God's faithful to do that. But these corrective measures start at that time. That still, small voice in the inside. Aren't you, aren't you thankful tonight for the Spirit of God? I thank God I've got somebody on the inside of me that, hey, he will not let me go, folks. I mean, he works in my heart. He has for the last 36 years. He's worked in my heart from the day I got saved on down. Boy, it just seemed like everything I did was wrong. And, and, and God just worked there. But you can quench the Spirit of God by not listening to that still voice. Then God begins this process of working with you. Listen, God's good. That's what He's doing in, in, in Psalm. He's asking for the mercy of God, not the justice of God. We call that throwing yourself on the mercy of the court. All right, I, That's a phrase they use. I don't know how that works. I mean, I guess if you said, well, judge, I did everything you said. I'm throwing you on my mercy. And He throws a book at you. Uh, does that work good, counselor? I didn't think that did. I, you know, everybody, oh, I got my pastor with me and I got saved. My, everybody, boy, I hate, I hate to hear that in the court. Listen, if you tell them you got saved in the jail cell, don't tell them in the courtroom. Just leave God out of this thing and go ahead and face your music and take what you need to take, all right? I stood with a man in court one time. He was guilty. He was going to plea a guilty plea. The judge looked down at him and said, uh, what do you plead? And he said, I plead guilty. And he looked at me. He knew me. He said, preacher, you got anything to say? I said, no, sir. 
I said, I'm just standing right here is all I'm, I'm doing. I thought to myself, this was his third offense and the same thing, throw the book at him. I thought, judge, break this business up. It's what you need to be doing and take care of it. So we find that confessing that sin to God, seeing it in the light that God does, and immediately when you begin down that road, stop it. Just tell God I'm wrong, I'm sorry, we're going to pick it up again. Hey, I'm talking about immediately. Now, when you don't do that, there's a process that starts. Evidently, David was in that process. Over in Hebrews chapter number 12, you want to turn over there a minute, and we'll probably stay about right there for the rest of the time, and then we'll go home. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 is, is a tremendous uh, uh, chapter on the chastening of God. If you look in Hebrews 12, want to look starting in verse number nine, or 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. Have ye ever forgot, after you were chastened to your parents, you forgot what the chastening was like, and you went on and did something again? That's what the children of Israel have done. I've often said, I remember my daddy whipping me twice in my life. I got over the first one. I don't even remember what it was for. I got over the first one. When he came walking down that garden path that day, I never got over the second one. He taught me something that was good for the rest of my life that day. I learned something. Now, they have forgotten something. Now, here's what they've forgotten. He says, my son. God brings this into sonship. We belong to God. Our bodies are not ours. They belong to God. They're the temple of God. Our life is no longer. Listen, when you get saved, your life is not yours. Your life belongs to God. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now, if he's chastening you, if you despise it, then eventually you're going to faint during it. Somewhere along the line. That's what I found, found Psalm 6. I thought it was amazing. This man evidently had had time to get right with God, but he chose not to get right with God. Man after God's own heart brought him down the road. Now, notice what he said. The chastening of the Lord, nor faint without rebuke of Him. Now, he claims that lordship over our life because of sonship. Verse 6, For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth. Why does God chasten you and me? God loves you. When I spanked my children, I tried to never spank my children in anger. I had somewhat of a temper years ago. And what I did, I would send them into the bedroom, make them take a belt with them. I'd have them sit on the bed and think about it. Let them hold the belt, sit on the bed and think about it. And then I sat in the other room where I could think about it and get Barbara to quit crying. <laughs> Amen. She's smiling back there. Hey, when mama whipped them, they got whipped. When daddy, when daddy whipped them, and I'd never, I never abused our children. But I, t I taught them something when I laid that belt on them. I taught them something it would take a long time for the, get, them to get over with. And I always explained to them why I was doing it. I never whipped a child without them knowing why they were being spanked. So if you want to know if you're being spanked or not, if you don't know why, you're probably not. God will let you know. But what happened was here, notice he said, Whom the Lord loveth. Love my kids. Love my grandkids. I don't let, I don't let grandkids misbehave at our house. They don't jump on our couch. They don't jump on our beds. They may do it at home. I had one of them one time tell me I do it at home. I said, you're not at home. You're in my home. Now you're going to sit down and be still what you're going to do over at Papa's house. And I treat them like they're mine when they come in the, in the house. Listen, when you put them in my charge, then I make sure that they do what they're supposed to do under my charge. Now notice what he said. He said, for whom the Lord loveth, loveth, he chasteneth, and then he said, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, the word scourging is a lot heavier than the word chastening. Most of the time when they scourged somebody, they took a cat of nine tails, 
And they would put bone and glass in those things. And they, literally, when they swung that thing, it would wrap around you. And when they jerked that thing back out, Listen, it would tear the hide. When they beat these people with this thing, they beat them so that they didn't get over it for a long time. And most of the time or part of the time, scourging ended in death. I believe with all my heart, if Christ had not been the Son of God, they would have killed him before he ever got to the cross. They did everything they could to kill him before he ever got to the cross. So we find because of the love of God that that chastening is progressive in its nature. Now, verse number 7, he gives a little bit of hope in here. He said, if you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. I thank God that God cares enough about me to chasten me at times. Matter of fact, in the, he, he, he used the... This word in the Old Testament, chasteneth betimes, B-E-T-I-M-E-S. Now, you say, what's that mean? That means when it's fitting to the time. You don't wait two days later. I hear people, you just wait till you get home and your daddy hears about you. Jerk, hey, you can take them out someplace. Wear, wear their fanny out. You say, you can't do that at Walmart. They better leave me alone at Walmart. That's all I got to tell them. I, I, I'm just... I say, and I don't tell them, I'm going to get you day after next or three, eight days down the road. I believe you need to thrust when the iron's hot and you just need to do what you've got to do. If I need to, I'll take them home at that particular time. But notice what he said in here. He said that if you endure chastening, God dealeth with his sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Thank God for getting a whipping. But you don't have to get the whipping. Do you understand what I'm saying? All you got to do is confess that thing and take care of it. Get rid of it in the beginning. Don't wait because eventually it will become public what is done in private. What you are on the inside will eventually work to that outside and there will be something done that will bring some reproach here. Now notice what he said. But if you be without chastisement. He's talking about a son and his father in, in verse number seven. What son is he whom the father chasteneth not? We live in days when they don't chasten them. We live in days when, boy, I, I see them all the time at Walmart. Got a child in a buggy just throwing what we used to call a conniption fit. Just absolutely throwing a fit in the middle. Of the, the parents have absolutely no control over them and they're a two or three year old. A two or three year old knows better. You need to understand, I'll tell you what, they know better under a year. I've spanked a diaper. I'm not telling them a brand new one, but hey, they lay down the floor and throw a screaming fit. I'll get down the floor with them and just love them until they get over their little fit. And then we pick it up and we go on. They bet. Hey, I don't like to continue to correct them for the same thing. Neither does God. But he said in verse 8, But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. He's just simply saying this, If God never chastens you, you don't belong to Him. I believe chastening is a part of the life of the believer with his God. God is a thrice holy individual tonight, and we're not, and we have a rebellious nature, even those people that are saved. We've all got a rebellious nature in them. Listen, I had one as a child, not in front of my dad and mom. Oh, you should have seen me. Hey, I, I pulled every prank in the world in school. I got whipped by every teacher uh, in that school up into the sixth grade. They beat me on a constant. Th hey, they just didn't beat me right. I didn't go home and tell my mom and dad because we had a rule. If you got one at school, you got one at home. That was standard procedure. That's called SOP. Amen. Step, standing, operate. I'd go home and lie to my mama. Boy, I'd come in. She'd say, have a good day at school. Yes, ma'am, I had a good day at school. You think I'm going to tell mama I got whooped? I didn't tell mama I got whipped. Amen. But I thank God for it. But you've had an illegitimate birth if you don't belong to God. If you never get chastened, you've not been born into the family of God because whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son. 
It goes on down in verse 9, Furthermore, we've had our fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. You say, did you get mad at your daddy? I love my father. When I sat down on his bed the week he died, it was yes, sir, and no, sir, with all the respect in the world. I sat down and I talked to my dad about salvation again on the side of that bed. I love my dad. I wanted to make sure my dad was ready to go and meet the Lord. He knew he was dying. I knew he was dying. I can, I can honestly say this before you and God that I have never said one word back to my mother or my father in my life. It's the kind of home that I was raised in. Now, wasn't a good boy in a lot of other places out of their sight, but I, I love, I gave my mom and my dad my reverence. All the days of my life, I reverenced them. But he talked about, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Now, I'm going to just read these verses. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemed to be joyous, but grievous. And nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Wherefore, this was where David was in verse 12. Lift up your hands which hang down and your feeble knees. He had stood before God and for whatever reason known to God, he had not gotten that right for a while and God got him right. But he said, And make straight the paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it be rather be healed. Follow peace with all men in holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Two ways that you can take chastening. One, you can get it right when you do it. Be sensitive to sin in your life. Don't let it get a toehold in your life. But if you do not, then you enter into a path of continual and escalatory. Is that a good word? I don't know if that, maybe I just made that one up, all right? God will just continue to build that chastening in your life until you either get it right or he takes you home when you don't get it right. God will never let you go back to where you came from. Recognition of sinfulness and repentance of sinfulness. Proverbs 28 says this, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaken them shall find mercy. Amen. Chastening. If God deals with you, get it right. Let's stand this morning, this evening. I don't know if anybody here is getting a whipping. I thank God I'm not tonight as far as I know. Amen. But I thank the Lord that over the years God has cared enough about me as an individual and His child that God just dealt with me. God chasing me. God still does. <laughs>